This is Mr. Ashton going through the mathematics numeracy paper for the Unit 1 non-calculator intermediate tier from November 2016. Okay then, so straight away over the page, we've got question one. It says, Marcus is a farmer. He has his own conversion graph to change between acres and square yards. And we're given this graph here. It then says, complete each of the following statements. Three acres is equivalent to or is equal to how many square yards? So the first thing that you would expect to do is to go and get your ruler, go up to three, and you'll notice there's no part of the graph there. Now, there's two things you can do here. You can either just extend this graph quite happily up to there and then come up and read the, this value here. And you know it must be the top box there. So all we need to do is work out how much that box is equal to and add it on to 12,100. So we know that box is 2,420, uh, and we need to add it on to 12,100. So writing it nice and uh, nice and simply into place value, and then the 2,420 coming here, and then adding together these two numbers will tell me what the three acres is worth. So we get 14,520. There we go, just squeezing the two there. Now, the one underneath it says 5.5 um, yards is equal to. Now, this was the other way that you could have solved this. We obviously can't go to 5.5. However, we can go to a number that we do like finding, which is 1. Because if we know 1, we can find anything we like. So, I'm going to write down here that 1 acre is equal to 4,840. Now, I want to find 5.5, but because I haven't got a calculator, I'm not going to times by 5.5. I'm going to times just by 5 and find out what 5 acres is. Now, there's a trick to times in by 5. It's quite a quick way of doing it, but there's other ways you can do this. I'm going to times by 10 and then halve it. So, timesing it by 10 will give me 48400, zero, zero, and then dividing that by 2 will give me 24,200 for 5. And then to find 0.5 acres... I'm going to halve my one acre. So one acre halved would be 2,420. Um, oh, which we knew from there anyway. And then adding together those two answers. So I've got my answer for half an acre is that. And then for five acres is that. So to find five and a half acres, I want to add together 24,200 and add the 2,420. And adding those together, I get 26,620. Okay, then, over the page, we're told that we're going to be assessed on the quality of our organisation communication accuracy in our writing. So the main important thing to say is include any units when we're doing answers for millilitres, pence, pounds, and make sure that we give a description of what we're doing. So let's read the question and work out what it is that we're supposed to be doing. It says, Roland is going to buy some orange juice for a party. Which size bottle of orange juice offers the best value for money? You must show you're working. So the best value to compare all of them, they're all in different sizes. So 300 millilitres, 400 millilitres and 500 millilitres. So we either need to find a number that they all divide by nicely or find a number that they all go into nicely. So, for instance, if I was to use, uh, say, 900, I could work that out by times that by 3, but that doesn't go into 900 and that doesn't go into 900. So we'd have to find the lowest common multiple that all three of these go into. But I know all of these go into 100, and I can do that quite easily by dividing by 3, dividing by 4, and dividing by 5. So I'm going to do that method there, and I'm going to just state what I'm doing. I'm going to say to compare fairly, that's the key word here, to compare fairly, um, I must look at uh, the same amount the same amount of volume for price okay so to start that off i'm going to say 300 milliliters which equals 66 pence i would divide that by three whatever i do to one side i do to the other side to find out that 100 milliliters would cost 22 pence for this one. So every 100 milliliters is costing 22 pence. For 400 milliliters, I know the price is 92p. I'm going to halve both sides to get that 200 milliliters must cost 46p. So 100 milliliters must cost 23p. Okay, so the 300 milliliters is a, is a better value bottle than the medium one. 
And then for 500 millilitres, now notice that's in pounds. Everything else has been in pence. I'm going to make sure it's consistent and keep it in pence. To change that to 100 millilitres, I would divide by 5. So how many 5s go into 125 is 25p. So for every 100 millilitres, you're paying 25p. So the best value for money is 100 millilitres for 22p. Okay, so this uh, so the, the 300 milliliter value or 300 milliliter bottle is best value. Um, the next question underneath says uh, someone needs to buy exactly 800 milliliters of orange juice. Which is the best option for, for this lady? Now, if I was to go for the cheapest one, you notice that 300 and 300 makes 600, then 900. So that doesn't work. But there is a way that I could make 800 by doing the small bottle and the big bottle. Okay, so 500 millilitres at £1.25 and then 300 millilitres. Now getting that in pounds as well because I've used pounds. So 0 0.66. Adding those two together would give me 800 and that would cost me, uh, what have we got there, 11, 8, 9. One, one pound uh, ninety one. But there is another way that I could get eight hundred, which would be two of these four hundred milliliter bottles. So if we did the four hundred milliliters, which is equal to ninety two p, and we times that by two, we would get eight hundred milliliters. Be double of that, which would be one hundred eighty four p, which is one pound eighty four. So this is the best value. So two lots of this. So two of these. Two times four hundred milliliters is best okay that's all i've written down at the bottom there 200 times four, uh, two times 400 millimeters is best okay the next question number three says a survey was carried out to find health and teenagers buy dvds the following two questions were asked where do you live how often do you buy dvds never one to ten times ten to fifteen times more than fifteen times it then says for each question give one reason why the question is not suitable well in terms of um, the relevance here is what I would question about buying DVDs and where you live. I'd say that's not relevant. And that would be something that you should be taught to look at when, when criticising questionnaires. Not relevant to buying DVDs. It, why does it matter where you live about buying DVDs? Um, and then for the second one, um, it says for question two, what's wrong with this? And this one always comes up. You can see 10 is in both categories. So if I bought exactly 10, which box do I tick? So I'm going to say 10 is in both categories. It then says, uh, part B, the survey was carried out by leaving copies of the questionnaires on the DVD shelves in the supermarket. Give one criticism to this. So again, another classic one for questionnaires. This is biased. That's the criticism. Um, as people looking at DVDs, are likely to buy DVDs. If I wasn't going to buy a DVD, then I, a DVD, then I wouldn't go to that section of the shop. Okay, so to make it fair, you put it somewhere where everyone's likely to go. Okay, question number four says the map shows part of Wales. The position of Newtown is shown above on the map. So we can see Newtown there. It says write down the bearing of Welsh Bull from Newtown. Okay, and the key word there is from Newtown. That means we're going here and we're going to measure for Welsh Bull which we need to find on the map, and I can see it in bold there. The way that we do that is we get our ruler and we connect the two. And you then get a, um, a protractor and you measure having zero on where you measure from. So from Newtown there, let me just move that slidey thing. I hate that, that gets in the way. I make sure that my crosshairs on Newtown, I make sure the zero is on the north line. And I can see there that, that line is bang in line within between 30 and 40. So that would be 35 degrees for me. Now, with bearings, they'll be expecting you to put a zero in front there. OK, um, the next question that says name the place on the map, which is a bearing of 235 from Newtown. So we're still from Newtown. So we put our protractor back there. Zero is still in the same place. And we're looking for 235. Now, this is the beauty of having a 360 degrees protractor. I don't need to fuss about adding anything extra. I can just come across here. There's 230. It's 235 is this line here. So I'm going to mark that. I can see which town it's, it is uh, just because it's so close to it anyway. 
And when I draw that line there, we can see it's Plan Girik. Okay. There. Okay then. Over the page is still um, using that map there. It says the distance from Newtown to Welsh Ball is approximately 14 miles by road. Okay. So this distance from here to here is 14 miles approximately by road. Okay. Now obviously the road isn't going to go straight from Newtown to Welsh Ball. It'll be windy. Okay. So it's not quite as straight as that line makes out. It then says estimate the distance by road from Welsh Pool to um, Llanfair um, Cairnon in miles. Okay, so we've got to go and work out what this distance here is. So finding that place there that they just mentioned, here it is on the map. So where is it? I'll just make sure I've highlighted there so it's nice and clear which, where I'm working to. Um, I'm going to go and measure what this original distance was here, the straight line distance. And I can see that it is exactly four centimetres from what I've measured. So I'm going to write that down and say four centimetres was equivalent to 14 miles. OK, now I'm going to go and measure the distance between these two places here. And I can see I've got to measure absolutely accurately here. I'm being absolutely accurate. I can see that's not two and a half. I can see that's 2.4 centimetres. So. Um, I need to work out how much 2.4 centimetres would be. Now, to do that, I'm going to divide both sides by 10 to work out that 0.4 centimetres must be equivalent to 1.4 miles. So then to get 2.4 centimetres, I would times that by 6. So I want to do 1.4 times by 6. So to work out 2.4 centimetres, I'm going to do 1.4 times, uh, times by 6. So 4 times by 6 is 24, 1 times 6 is 6, add the 2, 8. So I'm going to make that it's 8.4 miles, OK? Uh, we're then told that Megan lives in Chemist Road. So where's that? So let's highlight that there. That's what I'm looking for here, Chemist Road. There. It then says, to travel to work, she starts by heading um, towards McCunthleth. Her journey is approximately 40 kilometres. Convert 40 kilometres to miles. OK, so 40 kilometres to miles. We should know that five miles, it's nothing at all to do with the map, actually, this one, is equal to eight kilometres. I know that her journey is 40 kilometres, so I've times that by five, which means I need to times that by five, so I'd have 25 miles. We're then asked, in which town or village could Megan work? So I know that four centimetres is 14 miles. So eight centimetres would be about 28. So it's just going to be shy of eight centimetres. So I'm going to measure on my compass eight centimetres and see where the land lies. That's going to be slightly more than 25, but it's going to be a good sort of estimate to see where roughly she could work. So getting my compass on eight there. OK, so from here, she heads towards McCunthleth and then she's somewhere around here. Now, you notice with my compass, I'm only heading here because I know that she heads towards McCunthler. So she's doing that journey there. So the only sort of town I'd say that she could go and work on is further on here to get to, which would be Aberystwyth. OK, so I think she works in Aberystwyth looking at that. She's not going to go if she works over here. So, for instance, if I did carry on my compass and work out that 40 kilometre journey, which would be anywhere sort of on that compass line, you're not going to head towards McCunthleth and then come towards here. So it makes sense. It's the furthest one. Along. And then finally, on this question here, oh, I haven't written in the answer, which I said was Aberystwyth. It then says a different map has a scale of one to one th uh, to 10,000. Megan measures three centimetres on this map. What distance does this represent in metres? Now, this one to 10,000, the important thing to know with map scales is that means one centimetre on the map is equal to 10,000 centimetres in real life. Now, because they want that in metres, I'm going to convert this to metres by dividing it by 100. So uh, 10,000 divided by 100 would be equal to 100 metres. So then three centimetres must be equivalent to 300 metres on the map. OK, then over the page, it says question 5A, students are taking tests in English and Welsh. 
The English test is marked out of 80. The Welsh test is marked out of 70. So both of those are important bits of information. English test is marked out of 80. And then in a different colour, Welsh test is marked out of 70. We're then told David scores 35 in his English test, which was marked out of 80. Can you estimate David's score as a percentage? So we know that he scored 35 out of 80. To turn that to a percentage, I want to make that out of 100. Now, there's no number that I can times 80 by nicely to get to 100. So I'm either going to divide that to make it over 10. But that means I've got to, so that would be divided by 8 to the bottom. But 35 divided by 8, I don't particularly know off the top of my head. So what I'm going to do to make my life easy is times it by 10 to make it out of 800. And then I'm going to convert that from being out of 800 to being out of 100. So first of all, by halving the 800 to get half of 350, which would be 175. I now want to halve 400 to get 200. So I now need to halve 175. So notice here I'm partitioning it to get 50, 35 and 2.5. Put those together would give me 87.5 and then halve that again to get 100 so half of, of 87 now because it's multiple choice you can pretty much work it out from here that's pretty close to 90 half of 90 i'm going to put a squiggly sign here is 45 approximately 45 out of 100 so it can't be that can't be that 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 leaves us with that that's the closest to 45 out of 100 now similarly here the welsh test this time 22 out of 70 so 22 out of 70, I want to make either out of 10 or out of 100. Now, the 800 went down nicely to 100 by halving, halving, and halving again. 700 does not do that. So I'm going to make this one out of 10. What do I do to 70 to make it out of 10? I divide it by 7. Whatever I do to the bottom, do to the top. So that would be 3. In the, um, so 22 divided by 7 would be um, 3 and a bit. So I'm going to put approximately 3. So I'm looking for that then to be out of 100 would be around 30%. OK, so again, 30%, that one is the one that's most likely to be. OK, the clue uh, or the hint in this question is that you need to read her hypothesis properly. It says Rowena states a hypothesis that boys do better in English. This is mapping Welsh against English. So I'm only interested in the English results. So looking at her English results, we have 10 that was scored by that people there. Irrelevant in Welsh, we're not interested. 20 in English there, 33 there, 50 there, and then 70 there. And that was for the girls' tests, okay? The boys' tests are on the next page. So if we look at the boys' tests, this boy got 10, which is the same as the one before. This boy got 20, so the two lowest ones have got exactly the same scores. Then 35, so this third person's done slightly better. Then 60, so 10 better. Then 75. So does the data support Rowena's hypothesis? You must give a reason for your answer. I'm going to say yes, because um, lower scores are the same. But higher scores for boys are better. OK, it then says, how could Rowena improve the testing of hypothesis? She's only got five pieces of data. I could have said here, no, because there's not enough data. So that's how she could improve. So more data to improve accuracy. Five will really tell you nothing. You need to do a lot more than five. OK, you're talking in the hundreds to get a really accurate answer. It then says, draw by eye a line of best fit for how many marks you might expect a boy. So we're talking the boys results here to score in a test, in a Welsh test, if he scored 50 in an English test. Okay, so we need to draw a line of best fit, so it's got to follow the general trend of the data. So about there, and have roughly the same amount of points above and below the line. So I'm going to have mine, it doesn't need to necessarily go through any points. I'm going to draw my line there. I think that uh, generally follows the trend of the data. I predict that these points would come on here and go over here. And then at 50, I'm going to come and draw a line from 50 in the English, and come over and I can see that it's two squares, two squares above the 50. So that's not 52, it's actually 54 because each little square is worth two, okay? The way that I worked that out was saying that we've gone up a jump of 10 in five little squares, so each little square is worth two. So that would be 54 marks there, okay, 50. Okay then, over the page onto 10. Okay, you've got an incredibly wordy question as is common 
in the numeracy papers. Take a moment, read the question, get your head around it, I'll start to go through it. Okay, it says, Markin has a market store to sell his painted t-shirts. It costs him £250 to buy 100 plain t-shirts. 50p to print a design onto each t-shirt. Now that's the key difference there, that, that word there, each, is important. Okay. We're then told that Markin sells his printed t-shirts at £4 each. Okay, so far, just information. We haven't been told anything at all. At the start of the week, his bank balance is £820. Marchin has 100 t-shirts ready to sell. He has already paid for these and printed the t-shirts, so it's done nothing to the amount in his bank account that's already been taken account of. We're then told during the week, Markin sells the stock of 100 t-shirts. He pays all the money uh, he takes from his selling his t-shirts into his bank account. He buys and prints another 400 t-shirts. He does not sell any of these. How much will Markin have in his bank account at the end of the week? You must surely work it. Okay, the key thing to work on here is here we're working through these bullet points here to work out how much money he has in his account at the end of the week and some of the information up here will be needed to work bits of this out first of all we know that he sells his hundreds t-shirts he charges four pound a t-shirt so a hundred pounds sorry a hundred t-shirts times by four equals four hundred pounds gained from the t-shirts so take uh from selling t-shirts Oh, I can't spell t-shirts now, that's embarrassing. T-shirts gained, okay? Now, that's going to be £400 that goes into his account. He then, so we can tick that one off, he then pays all that money into his bank account. So let's work out how much he's got now. He's got £820 at the start of the week, add 400 would give me £1,220 now in account. OK, um, he buys and prints another 400 T-shirts. So that's coming up to using this information up here. We know that 100 T-shirts is equal. So 100 T-shirts is equal to 250 quid. So 400 T-shirts, because that's how many he now gets, 400, and he does the printing as well, would be four times as much. So whatever I do to one side, I need to do to the other. So 400 t-shirts must come to £1,000. And then also he gets this design printed on. Now that's in pence, so I'm going to have that in pounds. So 50p per t-shirt for 400 t-shirts. So well, 50p is like half of a pound. So half of 400 would be £200 for the, uh, for the what is it? It's a design. And these were for the t-shirts. So then... That's a cost of 1,200 for um, total t-shirt cost. And we're told that he doesn't sell any of these. So what he has is an account, which we've already worked out here. He now needs to get rid of that amount. Okay, so that's what's going to be left in this account. So final balance. would be 1,220 take away 1,200, which would leave him with 20 quid at the end of the week, but with 400 t-shirts in stock. Okay, then question number seven. It says, when it is 21.30, so 9.30 on Tuesday in London, it is 02.30, so two in the morning, so that was 9 in the evening, 9.30 in the evening, to 2.30 in the morning on Wednesday in Dakar, Bangladesh. It takes 10 hours, 30 minutes to fly from Dakar to London. A flight leaves Dakar on Thursday at 1pm 1, uh, 1 local time, or 1300 local time. On what day and at what time should it arrive in London? Give your answer in local time. Okay, now the first thing we need to do is work out the time difference between these two. Okay, so when it is 21.30... In London, it is 2.30 on Wednesday, and I want to start working towards that time, but I'm going to do this cleverly. First of all, I'm going to get up to this hour by adding 30 minutes. Okay, I'm then going to get up to midnight, which would be adding two hours, and then I'm going to get to two o'clock by adding another two hours, 
and then to get to 20 uh, to 2.30 in the morning, I'll add another 30 minutes. OK, so that for me, by partitioning it and taking my way, my, my goal point being midnight or midday can tell me that the total time difference is 30 minutes, two hours, two hours is 30 minutes, which is a total of five hours. OK, so there's a five hour time difference. We're then told that it takes 10 hours 30 to fly from um, Dakar to London. A flight leaves Dakar on Thursday at 1300 local time, and we want to know what time it is in London. Now, I'm going to do this as a timeline, okay? Now, my timeline, I'm going to work in both times to begin with and then decide which one I want to pursue. So, I know it leaves Dakar at 1300, 1 p.m., so Dakar. It leaves then, and I know there's a five hour time difference where London is effectively five hours behind. So, to go from Dakar back to London, we take away five hours. Okay, so take away five hours from there would put me at eight in the morning in London. Okay, we then fly for 10 hours and 30 minutes. Now, because I want to know what time I arrive in London, I'm going to pursue the London time. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to add first of all the 10 hours which would take me to 1800, so 6 in the afternoon, then add 30 minutes, which would take me to 1830. OK, now that's all on the same day. So the time is 1830 or 630 p.m. and it's still on Thursday. OK, then question eight says the scale diagram opposite um, shows an Isedford camping field. The camping field is 100 metres long and 80 metres wide. A river runs alongside, along the side AB. There is a hedge along AD. There is a fence along BC. DC is an opening with access to the Eisted for camping field. Using the scale, and they put this in bold, so it's obviously going to be very important. One centimetre is equal to 10 metres. A barbecue area is to be built on the camping field. The barbecue area must be nearer to the river than it is to the opening in the Ice Sedford camping field, nearer to the river than to the hedge, more than 30 metres from the corner of the field where the hedge meets the river. Draw suitable li uh, lines on the diagram and shade uh, the region where the barbecue area should be built or could be built. Now, you will need a compass to do this. You'll need a ruler to make sure you're measuring. And we need to get our heads around what some of these things are. So I'm going to use highlighters to highlight. It said here, it says nearer to the river. Well, let's go and work out what the river was. It says a river longs, runs along AB. So if we just move the paper to the side, uh, they've labelled all of this stuff to me anyway. Here's the river. They've told me that it has to be nearer to the river than to the I Sedford camping field. So that's the opening to the camping field there. Um, what else have they told me? There's a hedge along AD. So AD is the hedge. AD is the hedge. And it says it has to be nearer to the river than it is to the hedge. So I'm just trying to colour code all of these so I can pick them out really nice and easily. Um, and then it says more than 30 metres from the corner of the field. Um, more than 30 metres from the corner of the field where the hedge meets the river. So where's the hedge? Hedge meets the river. Hedge meets the river here. Okay. Now, they've given me these bullet points, so I'm going to try and work through them in order because they've probably been put in that way to make life a little bit easier. So when it says it has to be nearer to the river, so the river's here, than to the opening here, near is there. If we find bang in the middle of there, that would be exactly the same distance each side. Um, so near to the river would have to be this side, okay? Now, to do that, they want us to bisect a line, okay? So to bisect a line, we're going to get our compass and we're going to pick either line, either AD or BC, as um, it's this whole line here and this whole line here. And we'll bisect one of those lines and that will cut it in half. OK, so to do that, I'm going to turn my paper 90 degrees to make it easier to draw. I'm going to open my compass to what is obviously more than halfway along that line, which for me, that obviously is more than halfway. That's it. Do a little bit more safety. And I draw an arc from D. I keep my compass at exactly the same width and I move it over to A and I draw an arc from there. OK, now there's no reason why I couldn't have done that at BC instead, but I shouldn't just do it in the middle because I have to make sure they're directly opposite. So either the lines would have been perfect to do that. OK, so now turning my paper back 90 degrees, 
I'm going to line up those two intersections there and there. And I'm going to draw a straight line here through the middle. Okay. Now, this bold line that I've drawn, that represents exactly halfway um, from the opening to the I said for the camping fields into the river. So this side here would be nearer to the river, which is what they asked for. So nearer to the river. Okay. Nearer to the river than to the opening to the camping field. Tick. It then says it needs to be nearer to the river than to the hedge. So if we look where the river and the hedge are, they're actually two lines that meet at an angle. OK, so what it wants me to do is to bisect that angle. Everywhere on the bisecting line will be equidistance or the same distance from the river to the hedge. So we're starting to look at like a line that's going to come here and it's got to be nearer to the river. OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is bisect the angle where the hedge meets the river, that line. OK, so again, I'm going to just turn my paper 90 degrees to make it easier. Bisecting an angle means I open my compass to approximately three centimetres. I put the point of my compass where the two lines meet, and I draw an arc that crosses both lines. So an arc that crosses both lines there and there. Okay. You don't actually have to do this bit, but I always do it. I think it makes things a bit easier. Where that arc crosses the lines in each place, I draw a blob. Okay. Keep my compass at exactly the same width now. I draw another arc inside the angle from each blob. So one there, moving over to here, an arc here. OK, now that arc there and that arc there, where they meet, where they intersect, I make a mark, another blob. I line it up with the angle and I line it up with where those two lines met. I draw a nice bold line there. OK, now everywhere on that line I've just drawn, if I turn the paper back 90 degrees, everywhere on this new bold line I've drawn is the same distance to the river as it is the hedge. We were told it needs to be nearer to the river than to the hedge. OK, so nearer to the river would be everything this side of the line. OK, so so far, the barbecue area has got to be under this line and under this line. So it can be anywhere in this trapezium shape here that I've drawn so far. The final point said it has to be more than 30 metres from the corner of the field where the hedge meets the river. Where the hedge meets the river. Oh, that river should have been done in uh, pink. OK. So where the hedge meets the river was this bit here. It was the same same sort of two lines here. So it has to be 30 metres. So using my scale that one centimetre is equal to 10 metres, and we should know one centimetre equals 10 metres, then to work out what 30 metres is, I've times that by three. So I need to times this by three. So I need to measure three centimetres on my compass. OK, so compass, three centimetres there to there okay i then go and put that where they where the two meet and you'll see it's very similar to that that first arc that i drew okay now everywhere on this line here this this bit here that is 30 centimeters and within 30 centimeters now they said it has to be more the 30 meters away from the corner of that field so we're interested in this side of the arc so finally the shape that we'd have is this bit here now it's very important you don't cross out any lines uh, or rub them out because they're what we call construction arcs and you'll get marks for those okay so you can see why this is a five mark question as it's taken me nearly seven minutes to explain everything it's not not an easy question at all by any stretch of the imagination OK, it doesn't need to be shaded perfectly. Something that indicates that it's this area here. OK, so I might even just finish off by saying here. OK. OK, then. On to my next question. It says, Lottie and Raphael decide to enter a prize draw. They agree to share any money they win in the ratio two to three, respectively. So if we've got Lottie and Raphael, Lottie would be the first bit because she's the first name. And Raphael would be the, uh, the second bit because um, he came second. OK, and that's what the word respectively means. After winning a total of £2,000, they think again and decide that Lottie's share um, should be increased by 30%. 
Raphael thinks that his share will be reduced by 30% because hers has gone up by 30%. Now, ordinarily, that would make sense. However, it's not the case when we're dealing with people who've got different proportions of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to say, um, it says, um, explain why Raphael's thinking is incorrect. I'm going to say, because the proportions they have are different. Um, 30% of two parts, that's what Lottie share is, she's the two parts. 30% of two parts is not the same as 30% of three parts. Okay. Um, the next question says, calculate the amount of money Lottie wins after. Now, that's the key bit here. After the decision has been made to increase her share. Okay. So, the first thing we're going to do is just work it out ordinarily by doing um, uh, by sharing between ratios. So, to do that, we need to add the parts of the ratio together. So, 2 to 3, we add together to get 2 add 3, which gives me 5 parts in total. Um, we're then going to do the money. So, £2,000 divided by 5. Now, to work that out, um, I'm going to do... 2 divided by 5 doesn't work, but 20 divided by 5 does. That's 4. But then I've still got two zeros behind my thumb, so I've got to put those two zeros on there. So 2,000 divided by 5 is 400. Just check logically that works. 400, 800, 1,200, 1,600, 2,000. Okay, so that is the total for one part. And then um, to work out how much money Lottie would get, she would get two of those parts, so 2 times by 400 would be £800. But she then has a 30% increase. Okay, that's what we're told in the question up here. She has hers increased by 30%. So now we need to find 30% of 800. So 10% of 800 is where we should start, which is 80. So 30%, make sure you can see everything I'm writing. So 30% would be Three times as much would be 240. So the amount of money that she has would be the 800 that she would have had originally, then the 30% at 240, which is an increase. So I'd add those two together. The 800 add 240 to get 1,040. Okay. Over the page, it then says, find the ratio um, that is now used to share the money between Lottie and Raphael. So what we need to do is write how much money they have. So we know Lottie now has 1,040. So to make that to 2,000, which is the amount of money that's shared, Raphael must have the remaining amount. So 60 to get up to 1,100 and 900 would make 960. And we now want to simplify that until we can't simplify it anymore. Okay, so we're going to start off easy. We're going to just divide both sides by 10. So rather than like simplifying a fraction, so 104 to 96, we're now going to halve each of those to 52 and 48. They're still both even, so we're going to halve it again to 26 and 24. They're still both even, so we're going to halve again to 13 and 12. And we can't go any further there because 13 is a prime number. There's no number other than 1 and 13 that goes into 13, and 13 doesn't go to 12. So now to Lottie's winnings to Raphael's would be 13 to 12. Okay. Uh, the next question is something we're more used to seeing on a calculator paper. However, they're just asking for the equation that you type into a calculator. It says, in another price draw, it was planned to give £5,000 as the first prize. To make it more popular, the organisers decide to increase its first prize by 26%. The most efficient method for calculating this uh, increased first prize is 1.26 times by 5,000. Now, where that's come from is because you are increasing by 20%. We treat that as 100%, which is the original amount. An increase would mean add. Add 26% would equal 126%. Percent means out of 100. So 126 divided by 100 is 1.26. That's where this number has come from. Okay, what we call multipliers. We're then told the second prize was planned to be £3,000, but it's now decided to decrease this prize by 6%. Then says write down the most efficient method of calculating it, okay? So the most efficient method is to always start with 100%, which is the original amount. A decrease means we're going to take away. 
we're going to take away 6%, which will give me 94%. Percent means out of 100, so 94 divided by 100 would be 0 0.94. So to work out that decrease really effectively, you do 0 0.94 times by the money, so times by 3,000. Okay, we obviously can't work that out without a calculator, um, but that's just the form that we'd write into our calculator. Okay then, over the page, have a quick read of the question and I will start to go through it in a moment. Okay then, it says stylish computer desk made of laminated wood, non-scratch top, length is exactly 2,000 millimetres. And that's the keyword here, it's exactly 2,000 millimetres. We're then told that Luke wants a new desk in his bedroom. The desk is to fit on the straight wall between his wardrobe and his bookcase. Here's the wall, here's the wardrobe, here's the bookcase. We're then told, and this is the really, really important part, Luke has measured the length of the wall, which is 600 centimetres, correct the nearest 10 centimetres, and it's the nearest bit that's telling us what to do in this question. The bookcase is 147 centimetres, so I'm going to start to actually highlight these things as well, which is correct the nearest one centimetre. So this was the wall, wasn't it? So it's all of that. And then we've got the wardrobe, which is 250 centimetres, correct, the nearest centimetre. To the nearest one centimetre. Now, the first thing that we're asked is what is the greatest possible length of the wall, okay? Now, to do that, you get you find what it's been measured to the nearest, so 10 centimetres, you would halve it to get 5 centimetres. To find its lowest bound, you would take off 5 from there. To find its greatest, which is what we are asked, possible length, you would add 5 centimetres onto that. So it would be 605, so it's the second option in. The next one says, what is the greatest, po or what is the least possible length of the wardrobe? So the wardrobe was measured to the nearest centimetre. So that would be 1 centimetre divided by 2, which is 0 0.5 centimetres. Now, to find the greatest possible, no, to find the least possible, that, as it asks for, I'm not sure you can see that, uh, you would take off 0 0.5 from 250, which would be 249.5, so this one here. Okay? Over the page, it says, can Luke be certain that the desk will fit in the space available? So he wants to put this desk, if we do the computer desk in green, he wants to fit that in there. Now, if we were just to do this without doing any sort of upper and lower bounds, let's just say we use all his measurements for now. If that's 600 centimetres, the wardrobe was 250, and then this was 147, the bookcase needs to be available to fit in what's left. And we're told that the bookcase, uh, not, not the bookcase, sorry, the desk was 2,000 millimetres. Now, they're trying to sneak us there. Everything's done in centimetres bar that. So let's change that to centimetres. That would be 200 centimetres. So 250 and 200 would be 450, and then 450 um, and 147 would be three short 600. So you think that it would, but it's all about the upper and lower bounds here, okay? We've been asked to show, um, can we be certain he'll fit it, fit it into the space available? Show all the calculations, give the greatest or least bounds of any measurement used in calculations to give comparisons. Now, the way that you should do any upper and lower bounds question is to write out the whole the whole values, okay? So we're going to start off with the wall. The wall is 600 centimetres, and then we're going to write down its lower bound here by taking that 5 off that we've already used to get 595, and its upper bound would be adding it on would be 605. Okay, we're now going to do the same for the wardrobe, which is 250 centimetres. And then it was measured to the nearest centimetre, so its lower bound is 249.5, and its upper bound is 250.5, okay? And then finally, we're going to do the same for the bookcase, which is 147 centimetres. Again, measured to the nearest centimetre, so its lowest bound would be 146.5 by taking 0.5 off, and its upper bound would be 147.5, adding it on. Okay, now we're not going to do it for the desk because we're told it is exactly 200 centimetres. 
So to do any upper and lower bound question, you need to think of like an optimist and a pessimist. If we want to be absolutely certain, that's it, certain is the word I'm looking for, that that desk will fit, we need to think of the worst case scenarios. The worst case scenario, thinking like a pessimist, is that wall may be a bit shorter than we said. It may be the lower bound of the wall. Okay. And then thinking of a pessimist, if we think the wall was smaller than it could have been, it could be that the wardrobe is bigger, taking up more space, and the bookcase is bigger, taking up more space. So we're interested in the upper bound of the wardrobe and the upper bound of the bookcase. So what we're going to do is add those two together, take it off that, that number there, that 595, and as long as it's at least 200 centimetres, then yes, we can be certain that the desk will fit. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is 250 Point 0.5, add 147.5, add those two together, 5 and 5 makes 10, 0 and 7 and 1 makes 8, 9, 3, okay, so these two together, the worst they could possibly be is 398 centimetres, now the smallest the wall could possibly be is 595, so 595 centimetres, take away 398 5 take away 8 we can't do, so we steal 1 from the 8 there, that becomes a 5, so uh, so it becomes a 1, so 15 take away 8 is 7, again we can't do 8 take away 9, we give me minus 1, so I steal 1 from there, which would give me 9, and then 4 take away 3 is 1, so there is, I'm going to say there is a chance, there is only 197 centimetres of space available. So the answer would be no, because the desk is exactly 200 centimetres. The chances are, if we just use the normal numbers, you could see that there was like a little bit of space. I think it worked out about 203 centimetres. Um, but if we worked with the lower bound of the wall and the upper bound of the other two things, then there could be a chance that it won't. So um, Luke cannot be certain. Okay. Okay, then over the page, question 11. So, question 11 says 140 girls were asked how long they spend um, revising for GCSE exams. The cumulative frequency graph shows the results below. It then says, estimate your median, the median time the girls spent revising. So, the median time would be the, the middle number. Now we can see that that point there goes up to 140, so the middle value must be half of 140, which would be 70. So I'm going to find where 70 is, which is clearly between 60 and 80. I'm going to draw a line straight over until I hit the graph, and you can see that it hits perfectly on the second indent in. And then coming down and reading that off, checking your scale goes up in ones, it does. I'm going to write here M equals 52, so I know that was the median line, so 52 hours is the answer there. We're then asked to calculate the number of girls who spend between 40 and 50 hours. So I'm going to highlight that one one colour, highlight that one another colour, okay? What we do from here is, well, what we want to know is how long is the answer between 40 and 50. How many people are in that bit of the line? So that bit there because it's 40, and then that bit there because it's 50. So the way we do that is we come off and read off this number here, which is bang in between um, 40 and 60, so that would be 50, and this one actually ends on 60. So the number of girls in this bit of the graph here is this distance here. How many people are there between 50 and 60? 10, okay? So the answer for that would be 10. OK, we're then asked to answer true or false for each of the following statements. It says 25 girls spent between 30 and 50 hours revising. Well, we'll have to go back to the graph to check that out, OK? So we're looking between 30 and 50, 25 girls spent between 30 and 50 hours. So if we look at saying 30 hours, which is there, 50 we've already got highlighted. We now want to know how many girls there are between these two numbers. So we're looking at more of that graph there. That means I'm looking to see how many girls there are between these bits here. So that number there is 30. 
30 to 60 would be 30 girls who spent between 30 and 50 hours. And they told me it was, where's my pen? They told me it's 25. Okay, it's not, it's, it's 30, so that's false. It then says no girls spent more than 80 hours revising. So we can see that 140 girls were asked. We stop at 70. So yeah, no girls spent more than 80. Okay, that's true. The modal group, which means the most, most common group, was spent between 50 and 60 hours. Now, if you look at where um, the modal group is, you're looking for the highest jump, the highest steepest bit of the graph, because that represents the most amount of people. So we're looking, yeah, we're looking around here. That's easily the steepest bit of the graph to give me the most amount of people. There's hardly anyone there, hardly anyone at all there, a bit more there, a bit more there, not many there, lots here and quite a lot here as well. The steepest bit of the graph will tell me the highest um, frequency and that's what modal means. Modal means the most often, the most occurring. We're then told that 20 girls spent more than 60 hours. So looking at this bit, um, bit here, more than 60, we're interested in, i use a different colour here, more than 60 is these amount of girls here. So we know that that is one little square up from the indent there. So we're interested in how many girls this bit of the graph represents. So using the scales on the axes, we know that the, the midway point must be 110, and then each little square is worth 2, so that would be 112 to 140. So to work this out, we want to do 140, take away 112. Well, I can tell you now, it's, it's certainly not 20, so it's false. Okay? I'll leave that graph there for now, because we've got another graph here. We're then told that um, 140 boys were asked how long they spent revising their GCSE examinations. The cumulative frequency diagram shows their results as shown below, okay? It then says Trevor makes two statements. The boys' interquartile range um, is greater than the girls' interquartile range. On average, boys spent more time revising. Are both Trevor's statements correct? Show calculations and give reasons to support your answers. So the first thing we're going to need to do is work out the interquartile range on both, okay? So let's do the boys first. So to find the interquartile range, I find the lower quartile, which is measured at one quarter of the cumulative frequency, it's 140 boys, so this one here being final. So we find half of that to get 70, and then half of 70, which is 35. So there's 30. 35 would be two and a half little squares, um, would be one quarter, okay? Now, when I draw my line there, I'm going to move my visualizer right down, and focus on it, you can see that that lands somewhere in between two boxes. Now, my best advice to you is to force it on what do you think is the nearest one, okay? You are allowed to do that. I'm going to force it to the one back, which is two little squares back from 20, there, okay? So I make my lower quartile for the boys 18, okay? Now, doing exactly the same for the upper quartile, a quick way to find out where you should go across the upper quartile is to add together half and a quarter, which give me three quarters. So 70 was a half, one quarter was 35, so 105. So I'm looking for 100. There's 110, five squares up. So 105 is uh, two and a half squares again. So I'm going to draw that across. There. And again, oh, this one's a bit neater, actually. I think it's, it's worked out a bit nicer. Um, I make that on this line here. And that is one little square above the midway point. So the upper quartile for the boys is 46. OK, so now I need to do exactly the same for the girls. But I could go and work out the interquartile range here first. So I'm going to say boys interquartile range is equal to the upper quartile, 46, take away the lower quartile, take away 18. So 46, take away 18, will give me 28. Now let's do it for the girls. So I'm going back to my girls graph here. So we're going to go across at 35. Okay, and I measure that out of being 32. I'm going to write here, lower quartile equals 32. 
And then I am going to go up to 105, two little squares on, hit the graph, bang in the middle, I'm going to force it across to 59, so I make the girls upper quartile, 59, so the girls into quartile range, just need back the sheet, is equal to 59, take away 32, which would be 27. His statement number one is the boys into quartile range is greater than the girls. Yeah, agreed, that's what I have. Okay, so the statement is true. Um, did you say statement, it's already there. Statement, so true. Um, statement two, it says, on average, the boys spend more time revising. Now, the form, what we call the average, is the median. We already know what the girls is. The girls median, so their average time is 52. So let's go and work out what the boys is. So we'll go over to the graph. We'll draw 70. You can actually see it's a nice bold line there already. So we come down and we find out it's 40. Okay. So the boys spent on average 40 hours revising. The girls spent on average 52 um, hours revising. So the girls have done more than the boys. And we're told that on average the boys spent more time revising the girls, so that's false. Okay, false girls median is equal to 52 hours, uh, boys median is equal to 40 hours. Okay, and that's all you need to do. You'll get a mark for each one and then proving why. Okay, let me just uh, get my papers together because that was going over quite a few pages. Okay, then question 12 coming right up. If you um, just want to pause the video, have a read through the question and start to go through it, and I'll help you in a second. Okay, then question number 12. Now, this is probably the hardest question in this paper, and this paper's had some really tough questions on it, okay? So this was what I thought was a particularly tricky paper with some, some nasty questions on it. So let's read this through and try and get our heads around it. It says, Petra is organising a prom for her year group. The number of people attending the prom is likely to be between 20 and 80. The cost of hiring or the cost of holding the prom at Hotel Afonwen is as follows. The hire of the room is £100. The food is £15 per person. A welcome drink is £3 per person. And the decorations is £2 per person. Draw a graph to illustrate the total cost of the um, of holding the prom for between 20 and 80 people okay now what's made it harder is they haven't given us any values of the axes but they have told us here to find the total cost so we're talking money from between 20 and 80 people now we tend to see price going up on the y-axis so that seems like a good decision to have however i don't know numbers that i can put in yet however i can go and do the people here so i'm going to label that one people and this one price and I want to go up, although it says between 20 and 80, I don't want to have a, um, what's it called, a skip in my graph. Oh, I, I do want to plot it um, accurately. So 20, 40, 60 and 80. OK, so I could go up to 100, but I'm only asked to go up between 20 and 80. OK, now what I need to do is work out what the cost per person is, which is 15 pounds per person, three pounds per person and two pounds per person. OK. So I'm going to say total cost per person would be 15, add 2, add 3. Or add 3, add 2, which is £20. Okay. Um, so if I had the maximum of 80 people arrive, it's going to be 80, um, 80 people times by £20, which would be £1,600. Okay. But what I have forgotten, or what I haven't included yet, is the cost of hiring the room. Now, even if no people at all go, I have to pay £100 for that room, OK? Um, if um, 80 people go, then I'd add on that £100 as well. So I know that my graph has got to go up to at least 1,700. Now, there's not a nice number that 1,700 I could go up in on my um, firm axes, uh, on like the, the bold lines. 
So I want to think of numbers that could go up to 1,700 at least. So 400, 800, 1,200, 1,600 doesn't work. So let's go up in 500s, 5, 100, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. I'm going to go up in 500s on here, okay? So let's say price in pounds, so 500, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000, okay? Now, I've already identified that if I have no people go, which is obviously on the axes here, I'd still have to pay £100 to that room. So working that out on my axes, 500, which is the jump, divided by 10 little squares, tells me each little square is worth 50. So 100 would be two little squares up. So even if no people go at all, because of that, I have to pay 100 quid. I know that for 80 people, that I pay 1,600 for the food, the drinks, and the decorations, and the hire of the hall. So I want to plot that at 1,700. So that would be four little squares up there. Now, those two points, I just need to line up with my ruler and draw a nice bold line connecting the two of them. Okay. Now you can see that I've had my graph continue. There's no reason why that can't. It doesn't need to stop and end within those two points. Although the real thing that they're interested in is in between 20 and 80. So they're only interested in this bit of the graph anyway. Okay. Um, we're then asked on the other page. Let me just put that behind. It says Petra decides to sell, uh, share all of the costs equally between the people attending. Let P be the total cost. Um, and... Let P be the price paid per person and N be the number of people attending the prom. Okay, then. So we need to write that form right there. Now, that formula, we already know that if we're looking at the price that we're paying, the price that we're going to pay is £20 per person. So you're going to pay... £20 per person, and to share this equally between the people, we're going to have to add on the cost of hiring the venue, but to share it equally between all the people, we'd share it by the number of people, okay? So my formula is 20N, 20 times by the number of people, plus their individual share of hiring that room, so 100 divided by N. So for instance, if 20 people went, 100 divided by 20 would be each person paying £5 to rent the hall, whereas if 50 people went, 100 divided by 50, they'd only pay £2 each for hiring the hall. So the more people they go, the less they're going to have to pay. It then says underneath, it says, hiring a large room at the hotel costs £200. The cost per person for food, welcome drinks and decorations remains the same. If the total cost is 2240 how many people attend it? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the £200 that you paid to rent that room. So that tells you that I've had £2,040 um, for, uh, for people, okay? Just for the people, we've taken off the cost of the room. Now, we know that each person pays 20 quid, so 2040 divided by 20 will tell me how many people went. So I'm going to divide top and bottom by 10 to get 204 divided by 2, and then 204 divided by 2 would be 102 people attending. Okay, then over the page, on to the last question, which is a double page spread. So I'm going to have to try and work between the two. It says, complete the following table, range, median, and interquartile range for these diagrams. Okay, now, in terms of what you need to know about here, you've got a min value and a max value here. You have got a median value there in the middle, and then you have an upper and lower quartile here and here. Those are the things that go on with each other. And the ones that I'm interested in, interquartile range would have been my pink that I just did. The green was the median, and then the range would be the highest take away the lowest, okay? So I just need to come and read off what each of these values are. So in between 50 and 60, that would be 55. This would be 5. To work out the range of that... 55 take away, fifth, uh, take away 5 would leave me at 50. Um, the interquartile range would be 45 here and 20 here. So 45 take away 20 gives me 25. And then the median, oh, hang on, I've written that in the wrong one. That should have been 25 there. And the median was on the 30 line. Okay. Um, and then the next one um, is literally exactly the same sort of idea that I do. So the max and the min values 
here and here. The median is in the middle. And then the interquartile range will be using these two lines here. So I can see that the max value is 50. The min value is 1. So its range will be 50 take away 1, which will be 49. The median is too short of the 30, so that would be 28. And the interquartile range is 45 again, take away 15 this time. So 45 take away 15 would be 30. And it then says for part B, Yona is going on a holiday next April. She is hoping for good weather with hardly any rain. She decides to go to Norbury. So she's chosen Norbury, this one here. So we're looking at this data here. Give a reason to support Yona's decision. It includes values for both this one and this one. Okay. So in order to have a look why we want to go somewhere with hardly any rain, Norbury has a smaller average um, compared to Trefwin. Okay. So there we go. For me, that's what I would use. Okay. So um, Norbury um, has on average. Less rainfall than Trefwin. Um, Norbury, and then it said to include, it says include values from both of them. So Norbury average equals, uh, what was it, 28 millimeters, and Trefwin average equals 30 millimetres, um, so you would expect less rainfall. Okay, that was the last question of what was a very tricky paper, okay? Thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been useful. If it has been, please hit the subscribe button and you'll get access as and when I release any more videos. Thank you very much for watching.